So without further ado, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce the newest member of the 2017 GG Hall of Fame, my friend, my brother, number 59, Kevin Kelly. Thank you. Wow. I've known Kyle a long time. I did not know he could speak that well. <laughs> he got me nervous. All kidding aside, thank you, Kyle. Uh, Kyle hit the nail on the head when he said we met a long time ago. But Kyle was quite the player himself. Uh, started at Boundary Tackle for us for five years. Uh, in 2007, that culminated with his drafting to the BC Lions of the CFL. And without Kyle, we would not have had the success that we had as well. So thank you very much, Kyle. I know it's been said tonight, but it should be said by everyone that comes up to the podium. I'd like to thank and also congratulate the current GGs and coaches for everything that they do day in and day out to make us so proud. Thank you. Please keep posting on Instagram. I'm impressed by not just the facilities that you have, but you guys are way stronger and faster than I remember as being so keep doing what you're doing. Especially there's a guy who has a giant afro who impresses me every time I see it. There it is. I found it. You are one heck of an athlete, my friend. Keep it up. Uh, I'd also like to congratulate Gord Weber and Luke Shaver here, here tonight on their induction as well. Reading the articles about both of you and also knowing about your reputations before, uh, it's an honour just to be mentioned here tonight alongside of you. If this had been any other year and I wasn't being inducted, it'd be my honour to sit in the crowd and cheer for you as well. So congratulations to you fellas. I'd also like to thank the Hall of Fame committee, uh, in particular Rob Tallahoe, who was the one who broke the news to me uh, at St. Louis Bar and Grill over on Elgin Street. I was with Kyle, so things haven't changed that much since 2003. But thank you to you guys. I don't really think I can put into words the honor that this is, but I'm going to do my best uh, and, and bring to mind the emotions and the images that have been popping into my head for the last two and a half months, and in particular this past week. The image that comes to mind most is of a 19-year-old kid. Actually, a former coach of mine tonight gave me a picture of me when I was 19. I had much more hair, and I think it was actually the same size, so that's great. <laughs> but that 19-year-old kid had no clue of the journey he was about to begin. That 19-year-old kid was technically not a walk-on. I will say that. I was recruited, but with very little fanfare. Uh, I was already a student at the school. And I was at Tabaret starting my first course of second semester. And I walked on down to the sports complex where I met Coach Pichet, Coach White, and Coach Laramie with some other Ottawa midget football players for my recruiting visit. It was a great club sandwich. <laughs> it became painfully obvious during the meeting that though I was being recruited, they didn't know very much about me. When Coach Laramie asked me about my grades and what program I planned to apply for next fall when I was coming to University of Ottawa. I quickly informed him that I was already a student here at the university and I was looking forward to trying out for its football team if they would allow me. The meeting and the mood of the meeting changed very quickly when Coach Pichet turned to me and said, we have morning runs on Tuesdays and Thursdays, be there and maybe we'll invite you this summer. And he gave me his card. And on that card he wrote the room number where we'd be meeting as a team. And tonight I came to Coach Pichet and I gave him that card. The card is in the back of the room and on it I wrote, thank you Coach Pichet. I kept it all these years, I hope you'll keep it as well. <laughs> that winter in spring camp was a whirlwind. Morning runs, lifts, uh, insertions, whiteboard, film, all the things that we did and all the things that you guys do now were really overwhelming. I, I really had no idea what I was getting into. As time went on, I started to make a few friends on the team and I really didn't know how close I was to disaster throughout that entire winter camp. Um, as was customary at the time, and I truly do hope, and I'll sidebar on this, I truly do hope that we start bringing and inviting the rest of the players that are on the team to these in the future. Aside from the extra 50 people we can have here, it is such a close thing in my heart and to all my teammates that are here tonight that we did this for five straight years and got to meet so many different GGs from different eras. It really speaks to the storied program that we have here tonight. Thank <laughs> you. 
I was sitting at the TD dinner in 2003. I was sitting down and I was watching John Thompson being inducted that year. And there I was, a 19 year old boy, looking up and thinking, this little voice in my head, maybe that could be me. A glimmer, a bigger voice in my head said, maybe focus less on that and try to make this team. <laughs> that big voice was right because I didn't know it at the time. Quite unbeknownst to me, I was already cut from the team. And I'm serious. Before I get to that, I'd, I'd like to actually point out my Hall of Fame. They're sitting in the back, table 17 and table 18. I'm going to ask you guys to wave to everyone and you can give me a heck later for putting you on the spot. I'd like to point out my godmother, Kiri, and, her, and my two young cousins, her daughters, Shannon and Lauren. Kiri was the person who bought me my first pair of cleats and they hang in my basement right next to my university cleats. So thank you, Kiri, Lauren and Shannon. My Aunt Karen and my Uncle Haas, and I spoke to Stephen Drover, hopefully we can get it for next year. My Uncle Haas was actually the world's best auctioneer, and that's really a thing, I'm not joking. <laughs> Stephen, you did a great job up here, but it's time to retire from the auctioneering. I think Haas could fill in next year for you. Seated next to my father is my uncle Tex and his lovely wife Carol, who are at many games and of course all the big ones. If I could also introduce you to Kyle's mother, Debbie, who came all the way from Sudbury, not just to see Kyle speak, but she's been a, a pretty intricate part of our family as well as uh, Kyle's father, Scotty. So Deb Kirkwood. If you haven't noticed him, the little guy in the suit who's been flinging his food everywhere is Matt Edgeworth. <laughs> The table next to him is my son Everett, and he's right there with my lovely wife, Lindsay. Uh, though Lindsay was not around for my playing days, uh, she's been very supportive of my new passion in life, which is coaching and teaching. She's been right alongside me, and she's always been very patient and understanding that when we get to events like this, if someone ever brings up the 2006 Mitchell Bowl, and we're about to leave, we're there for at least two more hours. <laughs> Everett. You're still young, but I truly do hope that one day you choose my alma mater. Coach Barisi, you might want to get the commitment papers ready because Kevin Kelly 2.0 promises to be better than the original version. You should see him throw, and I've already started working on the form tackling. I think he's going to be a two-way player. <laughs> my mother, Roseanne, my father, Gord, and my sister, Kayla. Kayla, you have always inspired and impressed me. I think the only thing I was ever better than you at would have been football. And you can imagine how intimidated I was when you tried out for the team when you were nine years old. <laughs> Fortunately, you didn't stick with football. You did follow in my footsteps at times throughout your life, but those footsteps always became deeper. You recently done something that I did a few years ago, but I'd like to point it out right now. Kayla has just completed her Master's of Education here at the University of Ottawa, and I'd love for you to give her a hand. For the official record, just so you know, she outdid me once again. Her GPA was much higher than mine. <laughs> Mom and Dad, I could still remember my very first football game. My father gave me advice that stuck with me and I visualized every time I took the field, every time I took the field as a Gigi as well. He said that whenever I put on the helmet and I was putting on the chin strap, it was securing the hatch of a tank. And when I was on that field, nothing could hurt me. And I was the one who did the hurting. He was right. After 15 years of playing football, I came out relatively unscathed, that I know of. It would not be the last piece of advice he'd give me, and to this day, my parents have proven that the role of a parent never ends. Though I may have been a walk-on, if people could recruit parents, you guys would be five-star blue chips for sure. You have always provided me with guidance and advice, but more importantly, you believed in me and supported me, but were always there to catch me if I fell. And the times I fell, you always found a way to show me the lesson I could have taken from failure. It warms my heart to see you with, my grand, with your grandson, and I'm very comfortable in the knowledge that your wisdom will be his, and I hope that Lindsay and I can be for him the kind of parents you were for Kayla and I, and I thank you. <laughs> now on to my other parents. I'd like to thank my coaches. I mentioned earlier that before this journey started, I was cut. To someone who doesn't understand football, my son, who doesn't understand football or is the layman to sports, that might sound a knock, like a knock on the type of coaching we received here at the University of Ottawa. Quite the contrary. It was a show of the tremendous coaching I had for the five years that I was here, that they coached me, made me better, 
and always wanted to see me succeed. When I stepped on the field at nine years old to the moment I stepped off at the age of 24, I won the coaching lottery. Countless people that would pause their lives to give back to the game and help young men achieve their dreams. It has inspired me to give back and realize there is so much more than football that can be taught. And there are some of my former coaches before I came to Ottawa U that are here tonight and I'd like to point them out. My coach since I was a young child, Randy Bellini, who's the man who gave me the picture of when I was 19 years old, and I thank you for that, Randy. Bill McNeely as well, who was a coach with Randy in the Orleans Bengals days. Carl Tolmey, who is currently the offensive line coach here at the University of Ottawa, really goes to show how much coaching I had over the years. A university coach was coaching me as an amateur, and I was really lucky to have him. And Trevor Monaghan, who I don't think is here anymore because he has a young three month at home, but he did just get engaged today. So congratulations, there he is. He did just get engaged today. Sorry if that was a surprise, but you should have known better. I'm walking in front of a microphone tonight. <laughs> the concept of helping young men to succeed and achieve their goals was never lost on Denny Pichet. Coach Pichet, I think you took great joy every year at the All-Canadian Banquets, reminding me that I was almost cut once. And I hope you could take joy in reminding you now, or me reminding you now, that I was almost cut once, yet here I stand in the Hall of Fame you already reside in. Thank you, Coach. Not a day goes by, Coach, that some of the lessons you taught me um, can't be applied to the guys in the back of the room. Always remember that despite some of the issues with translation, Paris was never built in one day. You demanded so much from us, but you always showed us how to, deliver on those, how to deliver on those demands. There was a standard that you established and showed us what a GG truly was. Your passion for this team and the pride you had for our tradition was infectious, and you showed me what it truly meant to be the leader my team needed. All of those demands were met by every player that showed up and was under your tutelage. You brought this program back to where it needed to be, and you left it in pretty good standing. Thank you, Coach. Colson and Irv. My offensive line coaches. Offensive line, as you all know, is a very complex position, and I suppose everyone would probably say that about their unit, but offensive line, I truly do believe, is that. It's the perfect melding of strength and softness, violence and anger and calmness and patience. Those are the things that I think Irv and Colson truly emulated. Coach Irv joined us in my last two years, and he gave us the concept of playoff nasty. To, Ner to Irv, it was the little things that made you a better offensive lineman. The small things like driving your knee through the rib cage of a linebacker when you climb second level and pancake them. Or it was the subtle nuance of throwing a haymaker to the armpit of a defensive end who tried to swim you. <laughs> that level of aggression, I think, has stayed with the team and I see it on the field now and that came from Coach Irv. Coach Colson, I don't think there are enough words to do you justice. For five years, I had the opportunity to be coached by you, and at the time, I probably took it for granted. You had very high expectations for us as an offensive line. You developed lessons, drills, and practice plans to help us meet those expectations. You never allowed us to be complacent, and at times, it may have driven us nuts and hurt our egos, but your commitment to the team made us look past that because it made us better players. I think what I took for granted the most, Coach, it didn't matter if you were a rookie center or a five-year All-Canadian. If you made a mistake, you were going to hear it. But if you did something noteworthy, you were going to hear it too. You have a gift for coaching. I hope you never stop coaching. And I thank you for everything you gave me in those years. Thank you, Coach. Dan Laramie, who's not here tonight, he's at the uh, All-Star game that I'm supposed to be at. I managed to skip it, and I, I think for good reason. Uh, but Dan Laramie was our defense coordinator back in 2006 uh, and 2007. But he was also our offense coordinator in 2003 and 2004. And he left a, uh, a wealth of knowledge with the players that he talked to. Even the simplest conversation would have you walking away being a better football player. I thank Coach Laramie, who's not here tonight. I could thank all the coaches individually, but I've been told there's a time limit and I'm sure over it right now. Uh, to all my coaches, doctors, trainers, and support staff I had the pleasure of working with, I thank you from the bottom of my heart for all the hard work you did, and it's sometimes with little to no accolade or applause. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
In the early years of my Gigi career, we were an awful team. And I mean that honestly. We were three and six in that first year. We barely squeaked in the playoffs, but back then eight teams made the playoffs. With the majority of our roster being first and second year players, we were essentially boys playing amongst men. I think it was the Ottawa Citizen in the title after that first game that said it would be baptism by fire for the young GGs. This week, thinking of that 19 year old boy, I think back to my first game and I'd like to share with you a story from that game. True to form, as a rookie, I got to uh, the old Frank Clair Stadium and sat down and began to unpack my bag and my equipment, got my pants on, my girdle, hip bone, tailbone, jerseys there, no shoulder pads and helmet. Forgot them back at the sports complex. As a rookie going into his first game, not something you want to do. Coach Pichet, you were always very busy that day and I thank God for that because you never did find out that I forgot the helmet and shoulder pads that day. <laughs> I think had you known that would have been the first game I got to stand on the sidelines in my pants and girdle while I watched everyone else play football. After I went back to the sports complex, got my helmet and shoulder pads, I sat down and any of the guys in the back would know this name, but Ben Boule, and some of the 2000 guys that are here would have played with him as well. Ben Boule was in the room and he was actually center at the time, I was playing guard for the first four games that year. And there I am, I'm a rookie, I'm nervous, just as nervous as I was tonight to come up and give this speech. But Ben Boule sat across from me and I'm trying to get an idea from the other vets on how I should be acting before this game and there's Ben Boule. And he's taping up his non-snapping hand. And if I could describe it to you guys, if you've ever seen the movie Slapshot, it's the scene where they're putting tin foil on their knuckles and they're taping up their hands like a boxer. Bizarre, just bizarre. <laughs> Not unlike Ben Boulay, if you knew him. There's Ben, he's got a 100 mile stare going on and he's taping up his hand like a boxer. It just doesn't make sense. We get out into the game, we're playing against Laurier, the guy I'm going against, much bigger than me, he's a fifth year player, and it was the first run play uh, that we had, it was a stalemate, walking back to the huddle, not something to mail home about, but certainly not a loss, that's great. Second play, I'm out there, the ball snapped, it's a pass, I get my hands out, I lock on, I grab a hold of the breastplate, and I start thinking in my head, oh my god, I'm blocking this guy, I can hold him, I can play at this level, this is it. And suddenly, out of the corner of my eye, I see that taped hand from Ben Boulay, <laughs> crossing my line of vision and it makes contact right under the jaw of the guy I'm blocking and he just drops like a sack of bricks. <laughs> and Ben stands over him, looks square in the eyes, <laughs> looks me square in the eyes and screams out in his very thick francophone accent, that's how you play the game. <laughs> Fair enough, I figured I'd up the intensity just a little bit after that. <laughs> My father told me once that if I was lucky enough to find a friend who I can call on for a favor and they didn't ask why, the type of friend that you'd call in the middle of the night to bail you out, and based on how Kyle introduced me, I probably needed a few of those back in the day. But back in those days, my father told me, if I could just find one friend like that in my life, I'd be lucky. And tonight, I think that friend is here for him as well. I was so lucky, I found teammates entire teams of friends like that and many of them are here tonight and I'd like to thank you guys for being here. Wave the 2006 Yates Cup champions in the back. <laughs> Point out a few of them for you right now. Uh, the person who did the most work with me in the weight room would have been Mike Sheridan, uh, my training partner. I used to like to think Mike played uh, linebacker and DB for us. I used to like to think when Mike worked out with me, he got stronger and if I ran with him, I would get faster. Mike was always quick to point out that it had nothing to do with him working out with me and everything to do with him spotting me on chin-ups. Thanks, Mike. My O-line brethren, brethren, you guys were aptly named the Wrecking Crew and it was truly a pleasure playing alongside each and every one of you. In our system, Colson always talked about having a back door buddy, which sounds awful when I say it now, <laughs> but I always interpret it as no matter what the defense threw at us, I always had four other friends of mine, brothers, standing alongside to pick up anything that I might have done wrong and to always have my back. You guys were certainly that for me. In 2006, the score would call us the best offensive line in the country. They were right. Kyle, Frankie, Naeem, Pete, they're all here tonight. Just like every play from the line of scrimmage, if I'm going into this hall, I consider it your right as well to be alongside me. I hope you can find pride in my induction and know that I was nothing without you boys. 
Josh Jacoby. I'll read to you what I actually had planned. Though he couldn't be here tonight because just a few, hour ago, a few hours ago, his wife was in labor with their second child. Josh is currently here, by the way. <laughs> As a setter, I was nothing without my quarterback. I was lucky enough in those years to snap to, and I'll list the accolades because you didn't get the introduction I thought you deserved at the beginning, but the all-time leading career passer yards in GG history is sitting right there in Josh Jacoby. Yep. He was also second in U Sports history as well, and that record stood since 2008 when he's been done. Um, he was also our team MVP all five years that he was there, and he was our 2007 OU MVP. And when I found out that I was going into this hall, I'll be honest, I didn't know if I could look him in the eye knowing that I was going in before him. But if I can think about it this way, and I think I will, if I'm going in before him, it's simply because life mimics sport, and just like every goal line sneak, I'll cross that line so Josh can follow right behind. Thanks, Josh. I'll close on this. I talked earlier about the team giving me so much. This team really truly has given me so much. It gave me a world-class education, education both in football and academics. It led me to my career and fueled my newfound passion, which is teaching and coaching. It was through Mike Sheridan that I met my wife, and for me, this team has given me my family. This program has truly given me everything. I think back to that 19-year-old kid in 2003 sitting at his first TD dinner. To me, he is still sitting in this audience tonight. If I could tell that kid everything I know now, I would tell him he's going to have the most fun of his life over the next five years. He's going to be an All-Canadian. He's going to go to East West Bowls. He's going to do things that he could never have imagined possible when he was 19. He's going to win against Toronto by 80 points and lose big against Mac for four years. Until his last game against Mac, Alex Hode is going to recite word for word the Any Given Sunday speech. That's Alex probably clapping. <laughs> and after firing up the team, we would go out there for our last game against Mac and beat them by the biggest margin of victory, bigger than any of their margins against us. He's going to meet many interesting people that may change his life for a minute or forever. He's going to make friends he calls brothers. He's going to meet a girl he'll call his wife and mother of his son. He's going to make his parents and his sister proud on more than one occasion. He'll hoist the Yates Cup with his friends and watch the highlights all night on loop at the cabin while they celebrate. He's going to lose in his final game and take his helmet off one last time and be proud of the fact that the last uniform he takes off is the one he grew up idolizing. If I could, I tell that 19-year-old kid to listen to that little voice in his head that dared to say maybe because one day he will stand in front of everyone and say thank you for this honor. Thank you.